Well, how's it going folks? Today I'm really excited to have the great Wayne Benson here in the flesh, a new neighbor and an amazing mandolin player. You might know his work from Russell Moore and Third Time Out, or with the John Cowan Band, or with Livewire, or his work on the Ultimate Pickin' series, Bluegrass 95, 96, 97, 98, right. 99, 2000? I it? think 2001 was the last year. Oh, yeah, man. It took a while to beat that horse. <laughs> so excited just to be here hanging out, getting to talk mandolin as well. And to start off, let's just talk mandolin. What about the mandolin that you're playing here? Well, this is a McClanahan mandolin that I've owned for, I'm going to say about three years. It's the second one of these that I've had. The One of my students actually ordered this mandolin new and with a particular width neck and all, exactly how he wanted it colored and all that. And when he came to the house for a lesson, I really loved it. And then he had also managed to get on the waiting list for a Gilchrist and got moved way up. Oh, nice. And so he went that direction and I was able to, Jonathan was so cool, he gave me a name on his waiting list and I sold the first McClanahan to that person oh, nice. and then used the bread to buy this from my student. Nice, so that's nice. how I kind of worked into it. But I love it, it really... It kind of sits in the middle of those two schools of yeah, traditional does. tone and modern tone. It kind of does both of those things in its own way. Yeah, and you're saying that you've got the Diodario Manel strings on there, right? I do. It sounds really nice. Yeah, it's, I really like those on this mandolin. On my old Gibson, I play the... Recently, I've been playing the Chris Thiele oh, model right. with the yeah. New York steel, which I guess is nice. different, but... This particular mandolin tent seems like it really likes these. I was playing it a bit earlier and I can definitely test. It does have that kind of sweet spot between the more traditional and the modern sounds right. on the mandolin. It's really, really nice. And uh, Jonathan, like, he lives not too far away from here, right? Is he in North Carolina? Is that right? No, he's near Nashville. Nashville, okay. I've oh, never yeah. actually been to his house, but it's, it's somewhere in that area. The first McClanahan that I had, we were... Um, Third time out was playing um, in Florida, like our first gig of the year. And I drove nice. out and met Jonathan at a Cracker Barrel restaurant. And we sat in the rocking chairs in front of this place and met face to face for Whoa. the first time. And I got the mandolin from him and then took it with me, you know, to Georgia to meet the band and then, and then played it the next day at that wow. gig. And that was, I think, about seven years ago. I've been oh, playing his mandolins for that length of time that's so cool man yeah you know i've had some students recently ask me what to look for in a mandolin when when shopping for a new instrument do you have any advice or suggestions for what to look for man it's it just depends on what you're into at the time yeah. because your tastes are probably going to change you know it's really weird because we have this like 48 hour approval which is the standard for buying an instrument because oh. I, I buy a lot of stuff and own it for a while and flip it or whatever 48 hours is not enough. <laughs> you know, so like you can't really think that you're going to go like in a trade show atmosphere or something and you got all these other people trying out instruments right around you or they're, or, you know, watching some kind of an instructional video that there's a demo of and people are visiting with each other that haven't talked to each other in right. 12 years. Yeah. You can't sit there in that environment and figure out if you like an instrument. That's very true. If, yeah. if you really listen to closely you're not going to be able to to do that in that atmosphere it's hard to find an instrument that ticks all the boxes too i guess you find yourself wanting different things as time moves on or even wanting different things depending on what style of music you're playing or what setting you find yourself in in a band or at the jam and and there may be uh, right. several perfect instruments out there that suit different situations i guess right it, man even in one i mean in a perfect world i mean for the line of work that i'm in and the material that we play when um, when we do Erase the Miles, a song that was on the first record that Third Time Out recorded, that big, heavy, bottom-end, modern tone is would be the ultimate thing to have, like a well, load of that. I wish you were here with me I know it's not the ideal situation but then if we're playing You Took My Sunshine, something just hardcore in G where you want that really edgy note, then you'd rather have that, you know? Now 
that's that's why when you go see a great electric guitar player, they play a Telecaster on some stuff and then a, a Les Paul. You know, totally so we happens. have all of those sounds in the mandolin world too. We need some uh, professional mandolin techs to come into the scene to <laughs> right. tour with us for all of our instruments that we take on stage, right? That's right. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Man, I once asked Russell, just messing with him, and it was in a phase of the band where I was playing some electric mandolin on a few cuts, nice. and mandola, and mandolin, and I said, Man, we need a mandolin tech yeah. around, around here. <laughs> and his, he didn't say no. His response was, Wayne, there'll be a guitar tech on the bus before there's a mandolin. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't a no. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> you know, just in the past few years, um, we were talking about how it's been so great getting more into the online teaching scene, more onto the YouTube scene. By the way, Wayne has an amazing YouTube channel that you should definitely check it out, Wayne's World of Mandolin. And uh, I just learned so much by watching your videos. And uh, one of my favorite videos that you put out recently was your pick hold journey and how it's changed over the past couple of years for you um, to, to suit the styles that you're playing, to feel more relaxed and to feel more comfortable playing. Could you share a little bit more about that journey? Yeah, it's, I mean, early on, just when I started playing as a kid, I, I put two fingers under the bottom of the pick. You know, nobody was saying, hey, don't do it like that or anything. Mm -hmm. And I never honestly even thought about it. I just played, you know, and it, it, it was, it always worked for me. But then I grew to a point where, and this was many years back, I, I fell in love with, uh, with trying to pull off some of the classical stuff that I had heard Mike Marshall has yeah. exposed me to so much stuff, listening to his classical cuts from the from the 80s. The record, one of the records he did with Daryl Anger had the, yeah. what is it? Uh, that, that, that yeah. piece was on there. And I would have never thought that I would care about anything like that. But Chris Thiele's record came out with the sonatas and the partitas and i started trying to learn some of that stuff from tab and my hand would really fatigue oh. you know but i was playing like hours mm -hmm. at a time and really did become aware of the limitations of that pit cold and mm -hmm. then just kind of put it on the back burner for several more years and then um it'll be two years in january since I changed to the other pit hold. But it just took, uh, you just had to say, okay, that's it. From this point forward, that's what I'm doing. Because I went through this awkward transition from about October of that year until I made the commitment like a uh, New Year's resolution. Right. You know, but for I felt like I couldn't hold the pick either way there for a while. It was oh, really a, quite an ordeal to go through. That's frustrating. So how did you land on your current pickle? Was that through a lot of experimentation? And Just looking things? at other people and their right hand, especially Tony Rice. If you oh, look yeah. at his, like the hole that he has, and this knuckle is kind of out a little bit, but still it's basically that make a fist but not clenched you know just relax sure. so watching his right hand if you ever that video of him playing church street blues that's yeah, yeah. It's from an instructional thing that he did I've seen that. and it's you just get this great view of what he's doing and how perfect his tone is and his upstroke and downstroke and i got myself a rocking chair to see if i could lose these thin dime part time hell on church street blue I don't think he was thinking about any of that. Right. I think it was just all natural for him. But I would have to say his right hand is, you know, a big reason that I went with this when I changed. That's so cool. That's what I usually tell folks, too, is like if you're looking for ideas on the right hand, one of the best things to do is just look at what your favorite players do and see if you can emulate the way that it looks because there's so much tied to the way things look and the way things feel and the way things sound. But I, I'm curious too, like, do you find yourself um, switching between pick holds still or do you find certain, um, I don't know, certain things that you're doing required different approaches with the right hand or is it all pretty no it's, i try to stay with this and never go back to the two fingers under oh. and i'm and i'm i mean we're having this conversation but i'm really relaxed about this when if students ask me about it because there are so many great players that do it so many different ways right. if you watch doyle lawson's right hand where the fingers are down 
more like that, mm-hmm. or or Sam. And then there's Adam Steffi that you know with I his know, fingers. Right? I mean, there's not a right or wrong, but if you get to the point that you really feel like you have limitations because of what you're doing, it's never too late to change it. You know, I was 50 years old. I always feel a little bit hesitant about reinventing things in my own playing, just because. I'm scared of how long it'll take or scared of how hard it will be to change my habits or change my technique. What like what piece of advice would you give to folks who are encountering that that roadblock where they need to change things about the way they play? I don't know. I th- I think if the struggle or if you feel like there's a struggle or a limitation, that was my motivation, but as far as having like any kind of real advice that way, it's like anything else in life. It's you get out of it what you put into it. So you got to go for it. You said that you've been enjoying playing mandolin more since the yeah, change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like it's a new thing for me again, you know. I love that, man. Well, on the same lines of technique, I was sharing this story earlier about um, when I was in the studio with Mile 12 cutting our first record um, onwards, the first record that I was on with him. And uh, we were struggling playing this really fast song called The Ace of Hearts. And we just weren't, you know, gelling, we weren't grooving, and we weren't being able to keep up with the faster tempo. And our producer, Steven Motion, showed us this video of Livewire, the band you played in with Scott Vestal, just absolutely burning a version of Roanoke, I think at like Winterhawk a long time ago. And I think you guys were playing like upwards of 190, 200 beats per minute. What do you do to, to get to those levels? Is it just something that comes natural, something that you have to work at, something that feels unnatural? Well, it for me at that time, I mean, I would have been 19 years old, you know, when I was in that band, and I had literally never thought about technique. And if there is video of that, I can guarantee you that my fingers are like coming way off of the fretboard because nothing like that that I you know, maybe started thinking about, okay, I need to have a more efficient left hand. Mm -hmm. That would have been, um, I'm going to say like probably 1997 or 98 before I ever thought like that. And the live wire band started in, I think, 88 or 89 was when we put that together. So a lot of that was just being young and no fear you know when you're when you really don't know anything about technique or anything about scales or theory or anything like that and you just play there's a beauty in that Mm -hmm. and once you become a person that's thought about all of it you can never go back to what that was you know for me like after changing my pick hold i would concentrate on playing a solo exactly the same way every time because it turned into a 100% physical challenge to Mm -hmm. be able to do that, to play the fast tempo stuff. And with a new pick hold, I didn't have the courage to try to improvise really fast. So for the first time in my life, within the last couple of years, I've I've tried to Mm premeditate what I would have played. And like my version of Roanoke that I would have been playing when I was 19 years old, I'm satisfied the melody wasn't being played the way Bill Monroe was doing it because right. I would have sacrificed that for the speed. Sure, sure. You know, when your your mentality is so, you know, testosterone-driven when you're 19 years old. <laughs> totally, totally. You know, so it wasn't, not a lot of thought was going into that. I was just doing what we were going to do. The idea of premeditating, too, now, uh, it means a lot to me because... I was sharing earlier, like oftentimes when it comes time to perform or time to record, like I get I get nervous or anxious and I don't play the way I want to or I'm not satisfied with the way I'm playing. So I often will will think about what I want to play ahead of time. And I know there's like pros and cons to that, but it definitely feels um, like a way of organizing my thoughts so that I can hopefully play something more meaningful or more, you know, purposeful and musical uh, at, right. at the end. Um, I thought that a lot of people didn't do this at first and I had some reservations about trying it because I thought like everyone was just perfect at improvising and everyone who recorded, you know, just had this uh, unnatural gift at, you know, being spontaneous and playing things off the cuff. But only now realizing that like all these great players spend a lot of time premeditating and working out stuff ahead of time. When did you start doing that? And what was your journey to feel more comfortable doing that? Well, it's honestly, if you looking back to the 
the first musician that I ever would, I thought, okay, this guy knows a lot that most people don't know would have been Bela Fleck mm. from going to see New Grass Revival when I was a teenager. was lucky enough to get to see that band live dozens of times. Nice. And then later, um, way later, like after Kristen and I were already dating each other, she had these instructional cassette tapes that Bela Fleck did. Oh, cool. And so I would put those in the car with me, like driving from Nashville down to Atlanta, and he's talking about... Um, intervals and modes and language that meant absolutely nothing to me at this time and i was i'd been playing with third time out i guess um i don't know five years at the time and so i just started trying to transpose what he was talking about to the fretboard of the mandolin mm. and that was in looking back on it probably the beginning of me be starting to have some learned musicianship mm. because everybody if you if you thought of it as a pie chart you've got that percentage of that chart that's your learned musicianship how much have you studied the fretboard and then the rest of that is like the real world stuff like you just figure a tune out when you first start and you don't know what scale it's coming from or anything right. like that and then you become a combination of all of it so from that point forward, I started to try to learn how to use arpeggios to play over a, a chord progression and that kind of thing. And I'd never um, thought like that prior to that. Sure, sure. You know. Do you feel like the the learned aspect of your musicianship kind of mingles with that other courageous part to make you who you are as a musician? It it does, you know. But the ultimate thing is to forget everything that you learned, mm -hmm. like the the Charlie Parker quote and i'm not going to get this right but basically he you know that quote where he says we learn scales and modes and arpeggios and triads so that we can forget about it and just play because for me now like having those devices that are there and an understanding of that you you have to go through this awkward period of sounding like a, a musician that manufactures solos based on those devices mm. instead of just playing what you hear and so for me, starting that journey of learn musicianship later in life, the, the real fruit, I feel like, is still yet to come for me. And this goes back to earlier thinking about you can never go back to being that person that never thought about any of this who right. just plays with a reckless spirit and goes for it. Yeah. Once you ever step into this you know, pond, you're going to have to wade through it and become, hopefully, a player that's studied in some way to whatever extent that you study, and then you just play, and it, and you let your ear take over, but all those things that you worked on influence your playing, and you become comfortable playing more outside, if that was a hang-up that you had, or playing more tasteful, if you weren't a tasteful player, or didn't try to serve the song. All of those things get better. I've heard you talk too about how um, when you're playing with the John Cowan band, I don't know, like I mentioned, sometimes when I play live, I have that feeling of anxiety of improvising just because I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I, I've heard you speak to that too, how you know when playing gigs like that, there can be either stage fright or just kind of uncertainty about what's going on. What do you do to um, combat that? How do you kind of le lean back on that courageous aspect of your playing um, and not worry quite as much about how you sound or being self-absorbed? I feel like whenever I start navel gazing, that's when things go really south. <laughs> Man, I will try to um, to just get my mind off of really what's going on. And in the in the case um, we're talking about, for me playing with John, that was a, a I had plenty of anxiety during that time because I t I felt misplaced in in the group as much as I love John and his music and what he does. Man, who I mean, trying to think back to Newgrass Revival and Sam Bush's rhythm play. There's no way I'm ever going to live up to that standard. It's not going to happen. So just rhythmically, I already felt deficient because of knowing his past and working with Sam. 
And so that consumed so much of my thought that I felt like my improvisational playing suffered just for that. Mm. But I would try to think back to like going to see Newgrass when I was a kid and how excited I was to do it and how blessed I was to be in a band with John at that point and try to put my thoughts in a really positive direction like that to get past the anxiety. Oh, wow. You know, it reminds me of something I heard from Ron Block. He said someone asked him one time what he thinks about when he's playing, and he like took a pause and thought for a second. He's like, you know, I'm usually thinking about my wife and my family <laughs> and thinking yeah. about those positive things. Man, right? I totally... there. And certain songs make you do that with... Uh, one of my favorite songs that Russell sings is, is called Lowlands. Mm. And there's a, a verse in, in the song where it starts out talking about... Uh, the clouds began to build and and it ends up being a tragic verse in the song because these people lose all of their cattle mm. but um uh, i when when he starts to sing that verse i can remember a summer day that my dad and my sister and myself went to ride bikes in our neighborhood and it was right after a, a storm so it was really sticky and humid outside mm-hmm. But it was just a great time that um, that the three of us had. And the best that I ever play that song is when I'm thinking about that and not like, man, I, I want this tremolo to really sing right. right now. If I'm thinking about that, then it's better. So what do you do to strike the balance between trying to play something new and trying to recreate that good feeling that you had on a previous song? Because I feel like if I start to compare my performances to previous performances or try to play it as good as I did you know that one time I felt so good about it that's where I start you know playing worse as well like how do you keep experiencing things fresh even from a learned perspective man that's a great question it it, so much of it I think is just listening to everyone else Mm -hmm. because you always find that when you play great it's because it was in reaction to someone else's greatness yeah you know, and, and working with a guy like Russell, like the time, the coolest thing that I feel like I ever get to do is to play backup with him. You know, and yeah. like if it's a really straight bluegrass song, to be able to play something with a real attitude that still doesn't get in the way mm-hmm. of his vocal. And that's coming off of listening to everybody else. You know, because it's like when you go in a studio and the way so many places now have... Um, a mix, you know, where you can mix exactly what you want. And I remember Tim Austin had that technology at his studio, and he was talking about going out and just listening to everybody, everybody's mix, like when they would uh-huh. stop for lunch. And he said, man, great people, great players don't have their instrument turned up really loud. They're uh-huh. listening to everyone else. So that's my advice is always listen to what's going on and try to play to that, mm-hmm. you know. You can't do it by yourself. It's it's a team effort. So, Wayne, what have you been practicing recently? Like, what do you feel inspired to play? And what are some of the goals that you have for the upcoming months and years ahead? Well, I mean, I just want to continue to, to uh, plow forward and trying to learn more about the fretboard, but at the same time, just to play with a free spirit. You know, one mm-hmm. of the things that I've really been into lately, I love electric mandolin. Ah, cool. And I've discovered another, a YouTube channel I love. It's called Ask Zach. I and this, that one. It's this, he, Zach is just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to electric guitar, and he's a great player. Well, my little Telecaster octave electric mandolin, Kristen got me a Blues Junior amplifier for uh, Father's Day a few years ago. So with that... And a reverb pedal and playing that electric mandolin, I kind of forget about trying to think of playing over chords or anything because it feels so different and the sound of it is so different. And I think it's helping me to try to make the segue into just playing by ear and not trying to stick so closely to the things that we know are going to work, if it's Mm -hmm. a mode that you're playing over or a chord progression, to kind of try to forget about all of that and just play. You can't really think about two things at one time. So I kind of concentrate on the the sound that that I get because I don't really know anything about having a pedal board or anything. And I've learned a lot about that from this YouTube channel. So it, it almost feels like just playing with my toys, like that puts me more back in the... Spirit, I always tell my students if you're like when you learn a new device and you know that it's going to work musically, 
your approach to it should be that you're a kid and your parents just said you can write on the wall with a sharpie. You know, you can't you can't take it too literally. It still needs to have a creative spirit. So that's what I need to find. That's so cool. One of my uh, favorite books that I recommend to a lot of people is that Effortless Mastery book by Kenny. Yes, Warner. I recently read that. That's so cool. I don't I don't know if I agree with everything in that book, but. Uh, one of the main purposes or one of the main themes of that book was talking about how as a kid, when you first pick up music, you're just enraptured with this discovery and the joy of how it actually all works and how right. you can make these beautiful sounds. And it's not until a lot later where you start to worry about how you're sounding or how you're coming across to other people. But if you can kind of get back to that joy that you had as a kid learning, you end up playing better and you end up you know, learning more through the process. I agree. Totally. Totally. What do you have coming up on your YouTube channel here in the next few months? Do you have any plans? I do. I have uh, probably, I don't know, three or four videos. I, all the, My videos are totally done just on my cell phone. I think I have like four of them on there now that are edited on the phone that I need to upload. But one of them is going to talk more about the traditional mandolin tone compared to the modern tone. I did a video, um, the Memphis scale. Oh. The, that thing and trying to relate that to like the way guitar players use that scale, you know, because it's the third string and the E string and they and that pinching technique. But for us, it's these little shapes that we're so attracted to. So I have a video about that where I and it's trying to simplify the whole thought because it's a scale in six. That's what you're playing, but it sounds so intimidating for a lot of people when you hear language like that. So if we can turn right. it, like just calling it the Memphis scale, the way guitar players do, hopefully people feel like, hey, this is doable for me, you know, because it makes it more attractive when it's packaged that way. That's so cool, man. I'm really excited to see that video. And for all of your upcoming videos, I'm, I'm really stoked to see them too. Well, and, thanks, uh, man. I, your channel is awesome. I mean, being here and seeing the way you do this, and not only your content, but the presentation of your stuff, man, the editing and everything that you do, it's it's awesome. Wow, man, that means a lot. I'm so glad you could come and we could do this together. Thanks so much for being here, man, Wayne. Man, thanks for having me. Be sure to check out all of the Russell Moore Tour Days coming up. See if they're coming through your area soon. And be on the lookout for all those awesome videos from Wayne's channel as well. I'll uh, look forward to catching up soon. All right, pal.